And I guess for the folks joining the call, I can see a couple of familiar faces or at least profile pictures. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in. And for folks who wanna know what this conversation is about, this is all about the future of social media and communication. So we're seeing a lot of really cool trends in how we create content and how we engage with our audiences. And you know, Sam has this really cool perspective that content and social media and communication communication are converging. And so it's a really exciting space to be in, especially if you're a marketer or uh, you know, someone in social media at the moment, there's just so many possibilities. And we're seeing things changing even as we go with the pandemic, right? The TikTok came about, we're co-creating content. Um, and I think you know this is just gonna be a really incredible talk about how everything is converging and how can we do that in a really mindful way and leverage that conversion, convergence. Sweet, what an intro. Thank you, Samaya. <clears throat> cool, I'll give, I'll give people maybe like a minute or so as we're just at the one or the one o'clock mark or four o'clock mark Eastern <clears throat> um, to kind of join. Um, and I'll get started and start sharing my screen. Actually, you know what, I'll just load it up right now. And for folks who are joining, please feel free to make use of the chat and ask any questions. And at the end of the session, uh, we can, you know, cover any questions you have. Yes, and I'm gonna have my notes in the chat over on this side. So if you guys see me looking this way, it's not because I'm not paying attention or anything like that. That's just where my other monitor is. <clears throat> Okay, sweet. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll share my screen. And then just to confirm, let me move this out of the way. Just to confirm, Smile, you can see my screen, yeah? Yes, yes, I can. Cool. All right. Uh, so, uh, my talk or presentation today will just kind of be about uh, content trends um, and how I believe they are actually, the content itself is uh, the future isn't interactive. Um, and engaging kind of communities uh, with the creators and the actual audience themselves. Um, oops, hang on one second. Cool. <clears throat> um, and then before I start too, um, I had a little trouble with transporting this over from a PC to a Mac. So some of the images are a little tough, uh, which is incredibly embarrassing because I know most of you guys come have a design background. So bear with me um, and we'll kind of all work through it together. Uh, basically, who am I? Uh, my name is Sam Petralia. Uh, I am the co-founder and lead product manager here at bullhorn.fm. Um, we'll kind of go into bullhorn.fm a little bit later um, and just kind of like a fair warning or notice, you know, um, I, I don't want this to be seen as like a, a selling of bullhorn or like a pitch. Um, it is, I believe, bullhorn is capitalizing on the future of content. Um, but we're a very small team and we're kind of like a nascent or immature startup. <clears throat> so any suggestions or uh, comments that you guys have is kind of what I'm looking for at the end that we get wrapped up in the discussion, open to kind of all ideas or uh, questions. Uh, but yeah, cool. Um, so a quick little agenda for the meeting um, intro. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, I'll go into the kind of current state of content, um, some content trends that we're experiencing or seeing uh, my kind of hypothesis on the future of content, bullhorns fit, or the problems that we're actually solving. Um, and then we can kind of roll into the discussion and questions. Cool. Um, so I, I found this kind of fascinating uh, when on this kind of like journey of researching uh, and finding things out about like the future of content and its current state um, is actually a quote from Bill Gates, <laughs> which um, is kind of interesting. It kind of makes him seem like a prophet or an oracle here. Um, but he was kind of spot on and it actually kind of makes sense, right? Um, so he says, uh, content is where I expect much of the real money to be made on the internet, just as it was in broadcasting. Uh, when it comes to interactive content, such as the internet, the definition of content becomes very wide and no company is too small to participate. So I think this is pretty interesting how, um, you know, we see tech companies like big and small, even like, you know, ones that kind of like have traditionally centered on software and hardware, um, like Apple and Microsoft, they're all kind of jumping into the content space, right? There's Apple TV plus, right? They're hiring actors directly. So everyone kind of wants your eyes and attentions, right? Uh, Microsoft has a different kind of content. Um, they're not actually like producing TV shows, but they actually, I think they're kind of almost positioned in a better spot 
uh, in some cases because they're in the gaming world, right? With Xbox, the Xbox Live community and things like that. <clears throat> so also I wanna point out when he says, no company is too small to participate. Um, I think that's great because Bullhorn is a small company, but I really think it's no person is or community or even interest is too small to participate that we've actually blown up to a fact that anyone can kind of be a content creator. Um, and that it is kind of like wide open and there, there really are no barriers of entry in terms of creating content. Um, let, me, let me move my little zoom window over here. Cool. <clears throat> um, so kind of speaking to that, um, no one is too small uh, to become a content creator. There's really, when I say no barriers to entry, there are actually a few, um, but it really is just having a phone and downloading a free app, whether that's Instagram, TikTok, um, and you can use their creation tools to actually kind of start building a following <clears throat> and pushing content out there, no matter how uh, viral, cool, cringe, whatever word you want to say, uh, you can actually go ahead and start creating content right away. Um, also, what's kind of interesting is that because of the way platforms are set up, um, like TikTok and YouTube um, brand deals, and at now actually Instagram too pays for reels, brand deals aren't necessarily needed to make money anymore. So you don't need to be some big player. You can start off, um, you know, earning like a couple cents, a couple dollars here and there, and hoping that you know the algorithm actually makes your content go viral. And there's plenty of best practices to try to make that go viral, but it is still kind of like a, almost like a casino. You're walking in, you're gambling, and you're hoping that your content actually goes viral. Um, <clears throat> another one that we actually, another trend that it's actually kind of cool and interesting, is that they see that uh, user created content. Um, instead of like highly edited brand content um, gets more interaction. So now we actually see brands um, kind of mimic that. And we do that kind of here at Bullhorn too, where we actually, instead of making some very super polished video, we'll just go out in the parking lot and kind of film like a little ad off of our iPhone. And it does way better than some, you know, kind of video created by an agency. Cool. Um, <clears throat> I found this interesting. So interests are actually getting more narrow and narrow. Um, you kind of see that there's a couple of examples I like to point out here. Um, one off the bat is kind of like the Disney adult kind of niche. I mean, that's always kind of been around, um, just kind of poking fun here. But there, it's really interesting how um, Reddit has kind of capitalized on that. And they just allow kind of anyone to come. There doesn't need to be really too much approval, which is a good and a bad thing. But there are over 2.8 million subreddits, right, where people that are part of different communities are actually engaging and talking to each other. We see communities uh, pop up on like TikTok. So an example of that is like book talk, right? Where people just kind of get together and talk about books. Um, but these are just a few little examples of kind of like how content is actually, or excuse me, how communities are becoming more and more narrow. And we especially saw it during uh, COVID where um, people kind of felt disassociated or left out or kind of like missed that sense of belonging. Um, and they're not finding it by following a influencer or a celebrity that has millions of followers, but instead kind of looking inwards at themselves saying like, hey, what, am I, what do I care about? What am I interested in? And kind of going down um, the rabbit hole of finding a community. Um, saying the word rabbit hole can sometimes be negative and it definitely can be negative, some of these communities, but overall um, as the kind of interests get narrow, um, and they find other people like them on the internet. Um, that's actually kind of is like a more healthy um, trend. <clears throat> cool. Um, and most of my presentation today or later on will be kind of about how interactive content is changing things. Um, we're starting to see the big players in the space uh, actually kind of dive more into that. So on the very kind of low touch end, we see creators talking to each other digitally or like virtually on TikTok using duets, right? And then I can go ahead and duet that. Um, so it allows me to kind of actually engage, actually build upon that content. But in kind of like the bigger space uh, where it's like more and more customized or personal is we actually see in Netflix, um, they're actually doing like daily trivia with like trivia crack. Um, they've also come out with Bandersnatch on Black Mirror where they're actually, um, you kind of like create your own little journey. So it's way more interactive than me just sitting on my couch, watching a TV show. I'll probably pick up my phone during that TV show and kind of like mess around and not really pay attention to the content. But interactive content actually demands my full attention or at least more attention. 
And uh, I'm more kind of inclined to actually finish that content and actually have it, have it be a little more sticky. <clears throat> cool. Um, another thing that we're seeing is storytelling is becoming interactive too. Um, I'm a huge gamer. I've always kind of liked video games. Some of my video, favorite video games are the ones that actually tell stories. So not like the multiplayer kind of shooting games, but the ones that actually have taken like a book or a novel and like develop it into like a multi-hour kind of experience. Um, TVs and movies we've seen in the past have kind of always become uh, video games, right? Um, but now we're seeing video games kind of make that transition over the TV and movies. So Tomb Raider has always kind of been around there, but we're seeing a lot, a lot with The Witcher and a few other video games where they're actually going back the other way um, and they're making like additional content on top of like the actual video game or the story. <clears throat> uh, Leaders in the industry believe this is kind of some of like the stickiest of storytelling um, because it actually allows for differentiation in the story too, where my thoughts or my personal experience can actually lead the character in the video game down a certain path um, that I kind of control. Um, also creates more engaging communities uh, and st stronger revenue opportunities for the studios. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> another kind of current status or current trend is actually the rise of micro influencers. Um, so I personally have experienced this as well too, but I find more satisfaction following smart, smaller influencers and brands and I'm willing to support them more. Um, and then it kind of gets into like the ego baiting of it all of saying, you know, like, hey, I followed them when they were only at 10,000 or, you know, I followed them when they first made that video before they were viral. And then when the Neville really that uh, <coughs> influencer actually gets big, uh, we always say like, oh, they sold out or something like that. Um, but micro influencers are here to stay. Um, even there's kind of like the rise of like nano influencers now. Um, so on the right, you can see there's an influencer uh, tier distribution, um, kind of showing that it's very long tail. In fact, that like the influencers mainly sit on this nano and micro side, uh, and we're seeing more power kind of go towards them uh, as opposed to like the mega and macro. <clears throat> and why is that? I'll get into that too in a second. Um, but I found this kind of interesting as like a kind of general rule of thumb. Um, it depends on kind of what the influencer is involved in, of course. Um, something from like vertical farming to just like beauty, beauty products could be the range. Um, but generally they can make $10 per 1,000 followers per post. Um, so I found that pretty interesting. <clears throat> cool. Um, Rise of the micro influencers part two. Um, so kind of just breezing through this, um, people are more loyal to the micro influencers. Um, they see them as like more trusted. Um, sometimes you can see like oh, a big celebrity like Matthew McConaughey, does he really like that bourbon brand or is he just being paid? With micro influencers, we actually believe that like, hey, you know, this person actually generally like, or excuse me, genuinely believes in that brand that they're actually advocating for. Um, and one of the biggest things is that um, you can see a micro influencer in the comments um, or in like the like section, they're actually kind of talking, DMing back and forth and replying to the comments of their audience while like the me like the kind of mega celebrities or the mega influencers, they have someone else managing it or they're just not replying at all. And also it's important to note that <clears throat> brands are coming to micro influencers that are relevant to the brand or excuse me, that are relevant to their actually like mission. Um, so we're seeing, I don't wanna get too ahead of it, but we're seeing that kind of, like keywords, let's say like outdoors or like fishing, actually being replaced by an, a micro influencer that's fishing, right? So they'd be like, hey, instead of targeting the word fishing that Instagram thinks I'll like, I'm gonna just target a micro influencer and hope there's opportunity there. Cool. Um, another thing that's uh, kind of in its current state, but also continuing is privacy laws. Um, so the EU and the US are taking privacy uh, and data collecting more seriously. The EU definitely more <clears throat> than the US or they're the kind of the ones that take the first steps on big tech and kind of privacy. Um, but we're seeing certain states like California um, and a few other states actually kind of follow in their steps. Um, and with that, they kind of moved the market 
Um, and kind of, kind of the general sense is, hey, I'm distrustful of these big tech companies. They're taking my data. Either that data is being used for kind of nefarious purposes um, or it's just being stolen, right? Um, and there's, a, there's kind of like a bunch of movements out there. Um, some of them have to involve with crypto, which right now, give or take, uh, can also be kind of uh, distressful. But the idea is that consumers want to be in charge of their own data. Uh, they don't want to be data mined. Data is kind of considered like the new oil of the digital age. Um, so they either want to cut of it or they don't want it hap to happen at all. Uh, kind of moving on, <clears throat> this is actually impacting targeted ads more and more. Um, kind of from like personal anecdotes, I have a few friends in the e-commerce space um, and you know they, they kind of defend targeted ads and they say, no, they're good. Like people actually like kind of like the targeted ads. And I would actually agree that I do kind of enjoy the targeted ads once in a while. Like sometimes it's actually concerning how well Instagram knows that I want to buy that product. Um, but I think generally people kind of don't really like the idea that um, these ads are so smart that they're actually taking sensitive data away from me. Um, so the big question in the space right now is how will brands, especially smaller brands, adapt to keep to continue getting the attention of their consumers. <clears throat> so social media was great for these kind of smaller companies because they could reach out across the world and actually get customers instead of relying on like a regional basis. But there we're seeing like a big problem with of how they adapt to that right now. <clears throat> cool. Um, next up is the kind of idea of direct content. Um, so this is when the actual creators own the lines of communications and they know either their kind of audience's contact information where they're able to actually contact them directly. So comparing like Substack to Instagram or YouTube, um, a creator may have my Insta or influencer may have my Instagram profile or my YouTube profile, but they can't really like message me directly and kind of gather more information. But with Substack, they can hit my email right away. There's kind of like this built-in trust. Um, and then Patreon actually allows me to support um, the creator right away. Now we're seeing that a little bit, like we're seeing Twitter and Instagram kind of move to the subscription models where I can just tip um, people that like make funny tweets or anything like that. But we're still seeing a majority of creators say, hey, if you like to support me, if you want to give out some goodwill um, and allow me to create this more content, this be my kind of like profession instead of my passion, go to Patreon. Cool, move on. Um, <clears throat> another kind of content trend, and I'm definitely fall victim to this, is the content overload. Um, I saw some tweet the other day that was, you know, we live in an age of constant content shoved into our brains with a fire hose. Um, I was very distracted, so I couldn't find the tweet again. Um, but it was about like a YouTube video 15 years ago and like how it was like all seared into our brains um, and how that age of content was so more like much more wholesome and like meaningful. Um, and now you kind of just like aimlessly zombie scroll um, through uh, content. Um, the average screen time is actually six hours or daily screen time is actually six hours and 57 minutes a day for the average American. Um, I saw this and was somewhat happy because mine usually clocks in at like five and a half hours. But then I realized that they consider sitting at your desk, looking at a computer screen is actually part of screen time. So that made me a little sad because I'm definitely over that mark on that. So uh, maybe I need to bring down my mobile screen time uh, a little bit more, but <clears throat> we all know it's a problem and it's kind of hard to stop um, because of all the kind of passive content, but we're seeing kind of people recognize that it's a problem. Um, trying to get away from it in certain ways, whether that's you know screen time notifications, uh, time limit blocks, you know just even doing like a complete Instagram detox and things like that. So people recognize it's a problem. How much we're going to address that problem remains to be seen, but we're seeing kind of like a transition and like kind of like hey, you know what? These one, this platform is not good for me, and two, this platform isn't doing good for the world. So like, what can I do? Kind of a thing. <clears throat> cool. Um, and then here's some, not to even get a little more sad, but there's side effects of content overload, right? There's anxiety, depression, disassociation, which I think is a very one that kind of leads to everything. Um, here, there's comparison hangovers, memory loss, fatigue, and then also spending way too much money on targeted ads. Uh, you don't know why you bought, um, which I definitely fall victim to. 
cool. So here's my kind of predictions for the future of content. Um, I believe that it becomes healthier um, and that doesn't necessarily mean like health influencers, but the actual way the content is delivered um, and the goals of the content kind of change where it's not kind of, it's quality over quantity kind of a thing. Um, I believe it will continue to become more niche. Uh, I think we all express kind of a bit of pride in the niches uh, or the kind of specialization of content. You know, people like, it's funny, people take pride in their, their for you page where it's like, oh, my for you page gets this type of content or my for you page gets this type of content kind of a thing. Um, so we're going to see the continued like nicheification, um, so to speak. I don't think that's a word, but I'm going to continue to use that. <clears throat> and then we're also seeing um, content move to communication. Um, and that it kind of depends on your definition of communication. But the idea here is, is that it's, it's, it's no longer like a one to many but instead like a one to a couple few, but that few can actually communicate back to me. So it's more of a conversation um, than let's say like a lecture or a presentation like what I'm doing right now. Um, and then last, uh, the creators are gonna get support directly from their fans instead of the platforms, let's say like Instagram or YouTube, even TikTok actually being the middleman and kind of supporting them via ads or things like that. <clears throat> Cool. Um, oh, there's an extra bullet point here. Uh, forgive me for that. But the idea is uh, that healthier content is coming. Um, so there's kind of this move away both on the audience side and on some of these new platform sides that they don't want this kind of passive zombie, right? Um, it actually helps the advertiser and it helps the brands. Um, they're kind of in more interested into like active and engaging content instead of just impressions, right? They all want their clicks, they all want that, but also it really helps kind of the audience or the consumers actually enjoy that content and have it being like a little more meaningful. With that comes the kind of quality, uh, the, quant the quantity uh, is moving to quality, right? The longer I spend or the more I enjoy um, the content is better. So we're kind of like saying like, hey, you know, what are like the key metrics? Um, it's no longer time, impression, like attention, how much time you're stealing from my work day or stealing from my family, but instead it's the satisfaction your content gives me, uh, the kind of bang for its buck, and then also the subscriptions, right? So, hey, like, you know, a lot of like creators are like, oh, I need to post, you know, every single day an Instagram reel in order to make a hundred bucks a day or something like that. Uh, we're seeing that move to like, hey, you know what? I'll just post once a week. It'll be like a way better quality post. Some people will either subscribe to me via email newsletter or they'll just subscribe to me on an app and pay me a certain amount of money. It's better life balance for me. And I also am able to deliver better content to uh, my actual audience or my followers. <laughs> cool. Uh, nichefic excuse me, nichification continues. I know that's not a word. Um, and I'll kind of point out to the, on the other side, uh, there is a vertical farming podcast that I follow. Um, I find it very interesting, but the fact that it only has like 3000 kind of like subscribers, but it's a very viable podcast, I think is very interesting. Um, and something that kind of speaks to, Hey, you know, there can be small little like communities and they can be successful. Right. Um, and we're seeing a lot of like creators actually dive head first into those niches, um, and actually kind of experience better satisfaction as a creator um, and their audience actually enjoys it too because they're actually able to find a community that may not exist in their town or region but online they can exist and they can kind of talk about their problems and what they're going through um <clears throat> so speaking to that is the sense of belonging is one of the strongest human emotions we've kind of learned this over covid um digital communities will be strong become stronger and more specialized and also more meaningful um, and then ads will be sponsored and trusted by the content creators. Um, so this is kind of my theory that creators will become the vehicle for targeted ads and they'll actually replace keywords because they'll no longer be able to kind of keyword mine on a user. You know, if you go on Instagram right now, they'll be like, oh, San Petrolia likes, oh, I don't know, traveling, politics, all this kind of stuff that they think that, that I like. Some of it may be true or not. Instead, it'll be like, oh, San Petrolia follows this creator, I'm gonna go ahead and target that creator instead of just trying to get him in his normal feed. 
cool. Spoke to this um, a little bit earlier, but the idea that content will become a two-way street. Um, so what that means is that the actual audience will contribute to the actual content. Not only will they actually be talking to the creator um, and giving the messages, but the audience will actually become part of the content. They'll join, so they'll join the episode or join the Instagram live. Um, they'll kind of join the post, right? That you can see that now where it's like San Petralia with vertical farming podcast and we like post together, right? The feedback and reviews will be instant. So we see this kind of an is issue with like YouTube and podcasting, especially is that the feedback and reviews take, you know, like a week or like a month to determine whether or not, hey, that was a good episode or a good piece of content that I put out. Um, instead, we'll actually be able to see likes um, kind of live um, because creators will actually be able to go live and kind of interact with their listeners um, right on the spot. <clears throat> and then spoke to this again, um, but content will evolve from like a soapbox, um, you know, someone standing in the town square, yelling at everyone, telling them what to think or lecturing to actually a conversation and community where they're actually debating and kind of talking about ideas together. Um, and then also, uh, so direct support, uh, subscription and support will come directly from the audience and not the platforms. Uh, there's obviously still kind of going to be payment platforms like Stripe or Square um, in between the audience and the actual creator but uh, we're moving away from like Instagram holding all the keys to kind of platforms like Substack, Bullhorn. Um, and then there was a new one I actually saw yesterday called Beehive, uh, which is also an email newsletter, um, actually giving the keys um, to the audience and saying, hey, you know what, or excuse me, to the creator, actually saying, hey, you know what, email your followers, like go ahead and engage with them. Uh, we wanna help you do that, you know, and we'll take like a little bit of cut, uh, like a cut of it, but ultimately, it's opening those direct lines of communication. And because of the kind of interactivity or engagement, um, support will no longer be like, oh, hey, I just wanna support that person because they have good content or because they're actually a good person, but support will actually come to like, hey, you know what, I want access to the upper level of their content, or you know what, I wanna be able to vote on the polls that Samaya posts on their podcast, right? I actually want to be able to engage or even actually call into her podcast and actually talk to her. <clears throat> cool. Um, so that's the kind of end of um, the, my analysis of current content trends and where I think content is going. Uh, this next part kind of goes into what Bullhorn can kind of do. Um, now Bullhorn does kind of have, it's not so much like an Instagram influencer, but more of like a podcaster and we're tr trying to decide a lot of podcaster problems, um, but it does extend to other creators. But before I move on, uh, so I don't, I don't know if this is a good little time to kind of open up for like five minutes of comments. Um, but if anyone has any comments, questions, or even their own hypothesis, I would love to kind of hear it. Oh, I see the chat. I, was, I wasn't paying attention to the chat. No worries. We were just uh, talking about some of the uh, some of the, the the insights that you were bringing up. So, I think we were all stipulating on what does that interaction look like. And I agree, Miranda. Is it like a game show? Is it like card talk? Um, mm -hmm. Just thinking through things. <clears throat> yeah, um, you actually talked about like the Collins on the radios, and I think that's one thing that, especially podcasting or like Twitch streaming um really lacks is that we've actually taken a step back where you're not getting like um the dr phil or the laura schlesinger kind of calls and call-ins where people talk about their problems or like pose questions um obviously now in the age of trolls you always kind of have issues and risks around that um but that's kind of a great point is that we we used to live in an area where you know on car talk you used to be actually calling and contribute to it now we've actually taken a step back um, and now, you know, Bullhorn is kind of opening that, that connection back up again. Cool. Um, I'll move on to. Oh, I think Sandra has a question. Would this be part of gamification is the question. I think that's definitely uh, a possibility in terms of like gamification where, um, you know, you see it on Twitch where it's like, hey, if you want to be 
or even on Discord, like if you actually want to be a good member of this uh, community, you have to put in a, a certain number of chats. Um, and where they actually have like a level of like an, of an of engaged member of the community. Um, so if that answers your question about uh, gamification, yeah, I think absolutely. Thanks. We have a couple more questions coming in as well. Um, Joelle is saying, I'm wondering about predatory companies like MLMs. How do we prevent that type of micro influencers and false promises? That's actually a great question because we MLMs um i mean there's a there's a bunch of memes and a lot of discussions around that um i don't know how we, we kind of prevent that or how what's the angle on that i guess it really is like the kind of trust because we do see certain micro influencers kind of play into that um i don't know but that's a good question and any thoughts from you Samai? that is it i think this is all getting into the consequences of design i'm still thinking about you know yeah the previous talk was on sci-fi and consequences and um, kind of seeing the flip side, like here's all the good design can bring and, and an innovative product could bring, but what are the unintended consequences? And I think we're already seeing that with crypto and the way that mm -hmm. now that Meta owns crypto, uh, WhatsApp, you're getting all these crypto uh, DMs on WhatsApp. And so it's just really interesting. It comes back to the data point that you made of what data should be available and to who. And so maybe it needs to be an opt-in process, right? When we subscribe to an influencer, we're subscribing to all their content. And uh, we have built that trust to trust that, hey, whatever I subscribe to here, I trust that it's good content. I trust that it's good quality. Uh, but then we unsubscribe when we don't like that influencer anymore or that micro-influencer. So maybe to answer Joelle, to, to come back to the point, uh, maybe it comes down to consent and how we're consenting to the influencers we follow. Do we follow all of their pieces? Do we follow only a few of their pieces? Do we, is it like a Spotify where it's more like a playlist of different creators and then we follow just one song from one creator, but not their whole album, you know? So I think that's a really good question. Bruna has another question. So she's saying, do you think this kind of influencers who show only their normal day by day will exist? I really don't understand how can they produce a niche content? Interesting. I guess she's talking about the TikTok ones. Oh, like the, uh, the day in the life of like a New Yorker or like, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, if you think about it, that, that that's it. Well, I guess it depends on whether, whether or not they're traveling or what area they are in. Um, but they're kind of producing niche content for like a traveler. Um, so I guess that's not so much niche content or whether it would be almost like a, I, something a consumer would identify with, right? So vertical farming or like a passion that they have um, or a hobby. Um, so that's the kind of niche content and how brands can kind of help solve with that. So if it's like a day by day kind of follower and one of the uh, things he or she does is go to the gym, then they may be like, hey, you know, this person is kind of like a health lifestyle uh, influencer. Um, let's, you know, me as a gym brand, I actually want to reach out to her and kind of create a deal. That is a good point because there's, I think it's aspirational, right? The people who are following the day in the life folks, they're, um, I want that lifestyle. Yes. I want the lifestyle of being that fit person or that traveler. And so it's it's really what emotions that, that influencers stirring up. And so that their brand almost becomes about selling because they're selling components mm -hmm. of that lifestyle. Yeah, I saw a couple ones about New York yesterday and uh, the amount of brunch places they could have deals with is just crazy. Um, and like the, the food and like the uh, mimosas they drink, I'm like, wow, like how do they do this like every single weekend? But maybe they're getting paid, so. Yep, yep, they're definitely getting paid, I'm sure. And they're getting, having fun, right? A free brunch as an influencer yeah. or a free hotel stay. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Interesting, okay, so I love all these, uh, I love all these questions. So we have, oops, sorry. Clicked on the wrong thing. Uh, we have loud crowd takes a similar approach, but for consumer goods, similar to approach to micro. I don't know. I haven't heard of loud crowd. I'll have to look that up. Um, I think this will definitely put the light on the unsavory company's tactics. It would be insightful to see how a company responds to their audiences. Yeah, I think especially with the reduction of targeted ads, um, you know, like 
meta is kind of like a, a necessary evil for consumers and it's also a necessary evil for companies as well and i think generally most people don't really enjoy meta too much um but i think you know giving the power back to the actual consumers and the creators themselves and opening those direct lines of communications kind of get rid of those middlemen um and then it kind of becomes um going back to the comment about like oh how do you stop like kind of like a creator or an influencer that's maybe distrustful is they actually have to kind of build that trust over time uh, with their audience and um yeah i don't know if that answered the question but that was my attempt at it <clears throat> cool um sweet i mean all these questions are great i really appreciate them um i'm going to move on to the kind of bullhorn um pitch or where bull, what bullhorn's trying to do in the space uh, part of the presentation um, would really appreciate everyone to stick around. Um, my ask at it at the end of it is I'll show like a QR code and my email. If any of you are interested, I know this is kind of a design related group. Um, we have our product product designer Zane. Um, he's actually looking for UX testers or people to kind of try out the platform. So any suggestions or comments you guys have is greatly appreciated. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll kind of dive in. <clears throat> and this is I'm I cleaned up all the images because a lot of them failed on me um, when I was switching, but if any of them show up, um, I'm not going to get rattled and I'll just kind of apologize right ahead of you, uh, ahead of time. <clears throat> cool. So big statement here, uh, Bullhorn is the future of content creation. Really Bullhorn is going to be a part of the future of content creation. Um, so we are kind of focused on um, audio or podcasting, but we have expanded to include other creators too that just want to create content and engage with their communities. Um, but the idea here is that Bullhorn is the tool um, and this is single platform where creators um, can actually create immersive uh, and evergreen interactive content uh, with their audience. So they can do live episodes, they can do live events, uh, they can add visuals to their actual podcast, um, and they can actually engage with their audience through chat, calling, polling, and other questions. Um, and the idea here is that they build communities that just aren't like a flash in the pan. Um, but they're like long lasting relationships that actually make money and actually deliver um, value to uh, the actual uh, audience. <clears throat> cool. I like kind of telling this story. Um, so Bullhorn um, is a kind of interesting company. So we're not a true startup. Um, we are a kind of offshoot or a product of a larger company called Carrier X. Um, Carrier X is flagship product is actually freeconferencecall.com. Um, freeconferencecall.com has a very interesting story. It started off as just kind of like a conferencing platform, but they gave the tool or the conference lines out to people for free. Um, it became the world's second largest audio network. And it was actually interesting because we found a need for a bunch of large groups, communities, and even radio show hosts that actually wanted to broadcast um, on free conference call. So they said, hey, you know, I have this radio that's set up, for instance, in Haiti. Um, I want to attach a U.S. phone number to it because all my um, all my listeners that are immigrants in the U.S. actually can't listen to that radio station. I use Haiti as an example because it's actually, uh, funny enough, one of the biggest users of free conference call for our call to listen radio. Um, so we have people that want to follow up on political events or kind of elections back home. They want to listen to the local radio stations. They can't because the radio doesn't pick it up. Uh, in the car and in a lot of cases they don't want to use data on their phone so they're actually dialing into a phone number to listen to radio um, it's not just ha haitians um, listeners but it's all across the world um, so we saw that happening um, in 2017 um, and but we also saw the rise of podcasting um, so we set out um, my idea was to kind of make a product called bullhorn that integrated phone numbers on podcasting it was like oh yeah you know like podcasting is becoming the new radio let's attach phone numbers give out all these free phone numbers to every single podcast um, out there um, <clears throat> it worked it was kind of like a novel little fun idea uh, and then we kind of saw people moving away from one they had to be dialed into radio and podcasting um, but we were in the podcast space for a while so then we kind of dived head in and saying hey there's a lot of problems in podcasting um, let's actually launch a studio for podcasters to actually drop in uh, interactive content, uh, that being visual and actually engaging, like call, call a listen or like polls, um, in their actual like audio content, 
right? So we've actually launched the studio about a year ago. Uh, it's been under development. We've added video and a few other pieces that I'll get to. Um, but the idea here is that we want to take like an approach like Substack, where instead of someone clicking on a podcast, that podcaster gets a little tick saying, hey, someone downloaded your podcast, have no clue who it was. They might be in this area. Instead, we're allowing the listeners to actually chat, talk to the podcaster, and for the podcaster to then uh, actually communicate them to them after the fact. Uh, we started with podcasting. Um, kind of, I can sum up this slide is basically podcasting has the biggest problems out of like all the kind of media there is out there. Um, they don't know who their users are. They can't really track their ads. Um, and the analytics and the actual connection with their audience is very um, iffy to say the least. <clears throat> um, to kind of like really zoom in on that, um, you can see that podcast ad economics lag way behind everyone else. Um, part of that is because uh, it's super long tail and not many podcasts are actually able to monetize. Um, and some of that, and a lot of that actually adds to the fact that um, the podcasting reporting or attribution is very iffy. Um, and a lot of advertisers don't necessarily trust uh, podcast ads, <clears throat> but you can kind of see the difference. Um, it's not a typo um, actually in this report, social and TV had the exact same uh, CPM, which I thought was like pretty crazy. Um, but actually this isn't a CPM, but anyway, uh, the exact same rate, exact same rate uh, in podcasting is uh, about like an 11th or a 10th of social and TV. <clears throat> cool. Um, so the interactive media experience is lacking. Um, Twitch and Patreon have shown that people will pay creators directly and actually want to engage and have personal relationships with them. Um, this is kind of like a little chart of saying, hey, what are actually people willing to pay for? Um, so you see 41% are actually like interested in exclusive content, all the way down to transcripts, uh, Q and A's, uh, and actually live chatting with the host um, and like behind the scenes content as well. <laughs> cool, the slide worked. Um, uh, to host uh, interactive shows before Bullhorn, podcasters or even like YouTubers kind of had to create um, their brand across multiple different areas, right? Um, to foster community, they had to be on Patreon or Facebook to kind of have lives and hit people up on their like visual part of what they're selling or what they're actually creating. They had to be on Instagram to actually record with guests. They have to use Zoom or StreamYard. Uh, for direct in interaction, they have to get everyone's email, live chatting, YouTube, make money, Patreon, um, and then to kind of get like live feedback or it's like know what's up, um, they need to have Twitter at the same time. So it's very disconnected. Um, some podcasters or some creators might be good in one or two of these areas, but kind of fail on the others. Cool. Uh, these problems will be fixed. Um, it's not a question whether or not bullhorn will do it um or it, it is a question whether or not bullhorn will do it but the bigger question is um who's going to do it first um people are kind of running through this area spotify just actually released polls um we have substack integrating uh podcasting and videos into their email newsletters um so people are kind of recognizing the issue especially with the rise and fall of clubhouse that people wanted to engage and actually talk to each other but the way kind of clubhouse delivered on that was a little iffy but someone is going to fix these problems in this space. <clears throat> um, Bullhorn's offer is that all of this can be managed from one place. Um, you can have, you can still have your podcast. You can add clickable ads instead of saying, hey, you know, like, um, what's a very big, better help, right? It's like, go to better help slash Sam. Um, I'll probably just end up going to better help, not use Sam, not forget what the promo code was because you mentioned it and it's kind of in my brain, but if I had a clickable ad within my podcast, I could link directly there and kind of not shy away from the content or leave the content. Um, we, there's an introduction of polls, chats, messaging, um, video, audio. Um, one of the coolest, I think the way that Bullhorn uh, has taken advantage of the free conference call tech stack is that I can actually call in and contribute to the episode, right? So I can actually call in and talk to uh, the staff at NPR. And then finally, I can also support them too. Um, and all these features that you've seen, uh, the creator has the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm gonna put call in behind the paywall, or I'm just gonna 
offer a subscription just for goodwill and you guys can get all my content or, Hey, you know what? If you really want to vote on who you think should be the next president on my podcast, you have to pay me $2 a month or something like that. <clears throat> cool. Um, so the fixture creators, um, we here at Bullhorn believe that it's creating richer content. It's actually um, having the creators go live or actually have a simul live. Uh, and the simul live is actually creating the content beforehand and then dropping it on the red carpet uh, where everyone can kind of sit there and listen together, similar to like, like a Game of Thrones episode, right? Um, and then finally, them actually getting paid directly. So them leaving their rely or leaving their dependency uh, on YouTube ads or Facebook ads that they might not, not agree with and them getting paid off that and instead getting money directly from their listeners and choosing or even like choosing what ads are on their kind of content. <clears throat> um, so um, our challenges uh, going live and asking podcasters to record video is uh, a behavior change, right? So, um, you know, being a tech startup and actually changing behavior is kind of tough. Uh, our pitch is, hey, it's not a replacement to, to what you're doing, but it's actually a compliment. Uh, some podcasters and creators alike don't yet recognize the need of interacting with their fans. They don't see that as like a priority. Um, I'm hoping that changes um, as we kind of see, you know, uh, targeted ads and that disassociation grows um, and adopting more users with hyper gross uh, results could create a net, it needs to create like a network effect on Bullhorn. So it's kind of like the chicken or egg problem, right? We get creators on, the creators uh, go live and they're like, well, no one's listening to me. And then we go off and we start like a listener campaign. Um, and they're like, well, there's no creators to listen to. So it's a little bit of a chicken or egg uh, struggle. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'm just gonna throw this up on the screen while we kind of continue our discussion. Um, but my ask is that you sign up and try bullhorn, dot, uh, try bullhorn at bullhorn.fm. This QR code should lead to the website um and then you can you know email me with any questions or suggestions at sam at bullhorn.fm as well um i encourage you to sign up as a creator on the website um and just kind of test out our flow see how you like it um i have no ego so poke holes into the website and what we're doing uh, all day long really appreciate that um but yeah that's kind of where uh, my presentation ends i see there's a couple chats um, in the chat. But yeah, if you have any um, uh, questions, please let me know. Will you have a VR feature? Interesting question. Um, so we haven't been focused on VR. Um, we're still kind of in the immature startup phase of actually uh, making sure the users like the idea of going live um, and want to interact with their fans. Um, so there's no kind of VR at this point, but I do enjoy kind of VR. And I think that's an interesting, interesting area to dive into. I'll open up this chat, see if there's anything else. I'm curious, Ramona, could you, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to hear from you what, what kind of virtual feature you want. Oh, virtual concerts. Yeah, I was just thinking in terms of, since this is um, a lot of different ways to engage with your audience that you're pulling together here into one space, VR is kind of like that next frontier. <laughs> Uh, where, where people are moving into. So I was just curious if you were also considering that since people are starting to move more into like meetings in um, virtual spaces. Um, so if you had um, a town hall, you know, people could come virtually. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. And that like kind of to totally plays into it where like you can almost feel like that you're in a meeting room talking to your creators or talking to your friends instead of, right. when, you know, looking well, at a screen you, like this. Right, well, even if you gave a lecture, so even like um, another area would be like training. So, you know, usually there's a video or, or you could go live and people chat, but what if you were going live and people could be like sitting in the audiences, um, you know, with you. I know some people now are doing mm -hmm. um, virtual spaces where I kind of like Zoom, you know, where you can, have like at least your picture there so so you're in the vip section so you get your right. screen in the meeting um so I, I thought that would be a great um feature to add to this since you're pulling all of these other types of communications into one space 
no, you're, you're, you're right. I actually, that's a, that's a very interesting idea. I, I, I don't have any experience with VR um, other than just being a consumer, but I, I think that should, that's worth investigating. I appreciate you bringing that up. You're welcome. I love um, co-collaboration. Yeah, right. And I think it'd be, you know, it's, we're talking in a chat, we're talking in the conference right now. It'd, it'd kind of be more fun if we could all like see each other in some kind of like virtual world where like I could turn around and talk to people or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> right, it looks looks good. I'm going to um, put one more thing, I guess, on my plate to play around with this. Oh, please do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, looks like Rami's saying, yeah, promising to see that architecture firms are uh, established to focus on VR specifically. Do you mean architecture firms like actual, like real architecture firms, like building buildings or like uh, kind of like tech architecture? Let's see what. Let's see. Oh, interesting. Gotcha, gotcha. Huh, that's actually pretty cool, I didn't know that. I guess to kind of push back on Ramona's idea of VR, I think for conferencing, I still think, this is just my hypothesis, that mm -hmm. uh, people like doing it from home, like we're seeing all these remote work trends or hybrid work trends, but then I think for things like a concert, or a dance performance. I want the full interactivity. I or a theater, right? Like that, like a live, like comedy show. I want to feel like I'm in the room. I want to feel the interactions of other people. Um, so I, I think it's just interesting. Like, where do we want to be less of ourselves and remove ourselves a little bit? And where do mm -hmm. we want to just fully be in the experience? Yeah, it could lead to like a lot of uh, funny, funny uh, conferencing things too. If you can show up and. Like a superhero costume or things like that. Um, that'd probably be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <clears throat> it would turn into a party. It wouldn't be work. <laughs> <laughs> My dog's walking around the office. He's sneaking around. Kobe. Oh, everyone's talking about TED conferences. Yes. That would be really fun to see in person because I'm a TED nerd. I went through a phase where I, I watched like 50 videos a month on TED. But uh, I've, I've kind of gotten back into it too. I mean, they've, they've had one of the best podcasts for like a long time too. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like if I, if you could place me in like the halls where they kind of have those speeches, um, I'd love that even just virtually. Cool. Um, any other uh, questions, comments? Hi, I'm, my name is Chris. I'm one of the co-founders. Um, but I think just generally, honestly, it shouldn't be this challenging to like break people apart into like little breakout rooms or something so I think for education as well I know we want to be like oh my gosh concerts and all this fun stuff but I think the future of education is going to change a lot too and right now I have a mini heart attack every time I'm trying to use breakout rooms it doesn't work I'm and then people get like it, even so I work at Walmart and whenever we have breakout rooms everyone's like slightly more stressed out for the first 30 seconds <laughs> it's horrible so it's like why should it be this horribly difficult to have these conversations that to your point like in a hallway right like you just like designers and this is obviously not just for designers but people learn a lot from little like quick fire chats like little small moments mm -hmm. of the and they build bigger um relationships through time that that start off with a little spark and if you're telling me that I need to start this official breakout room environment, that's not a spark. That's like me with two sticks trying to create a fire. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, it's a very unnatural flow. Yeah. Um, I think you, you might have seen the email like 15 minutes beforehand. I tried getting in here and I was like frantically emailing you guys. I was like, hey, uh, sorry, I, I, I can't get in. Like what's going on? Like, and then uh, I just had to like log in and log back out. But for a while there, I was sweating. Um, 
Yes. But yeah, so that, I, every speaker, every speaker couldn't find the join button. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was a lot. There was um, I'm I'm blanking on the name, and this was probably like April 2020 when I was playing around with it. But it was basically like almost kind of like a Pokemon like video game where they would have a room and you would just control it and be like the keypad and walk around. So it'd be like, oh, a little couch area. And I walk into the couch area and then my audio that I would hear and speak to would only be people in that couch area. So they almost like, they essentially video, video game ifications it. Um, and it was like quite cool. I forget the name though. I'll have to like look it up. Um, they well, got some sort of metaverse. We just had a, a, a talk just now with Jamie who was also talking about the metaverse and how he utilizes that for their oh, really? community. It might be Facebook. Ooh, you like a Facebook product? Ooh, that's good. No, no, it wasn't Facebook. It wasn't. It was. It was some other. Uh, it was. I. I need to find it to prove you wrong, but it was something else. I'll reply to this. Okay. Later, but I mean, <laughs> you like a Facebook. Product. We're, we're holding Sam to it. If he proves us wrong, he gets a gift of some sort. Um, a Philly pretzels or something. We'll send you something. <laughs> Philly cheesesteak. There you go. Okay. <laughs> shipped shipped to wherever you live <laughs> you can live in europe we're gonna ship it to you <laughs> that'd be gross but cool this is great well, awesome thanks so much for joining everyone um i really appreciate it this was a lot of fun um yeah if anyone has any questions comments wants to connect after the fact um uh, you can either sign up uh for born uh as a creator or uh, actually shoot me an email um at sam at bullhorn.com I'll stop sharing now. Awesome. Uh, I think I'm going to bounce to the next session just like that. But this is great. I got to catch the talent. So lovely to connect and look forward to hearing from you in the future. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll probably see you guys in the next session. Hey.